Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Jules Bellamy. I'm from the Coastal Environment Centre. And with me is Jane Walsh, who I'm really pleased to introduce you to. Um, but before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. You're, we've muted you guys, so we can't hear if the dog barks or one of the kids comes in or anything like that. Um, if you can find the chat button on your on your laptop, you can always send some questions in. So we do have another staff member, Tim, who will be reading the questions out to us. So Jane and I will have a, a general chat about birds in your backyard, um, but please, if you've got any burning questions, add them in. And we'll also have a Q&A at the end as well. So first of all, let me tell you a bit more about Jaden. So really excited to have Jaden with us because a few years ago, when he was a bit younger, he used to come to our bird walks and our nocturnal walks and all our other walks and talks. And then fast forward a few years, he's at university studying biodiversity and conservation. And through a mixture of um, academic learning and hours and hours and hours of field observation, Jaden now has more knowledge than all the rest of us put together. So, um, so it was great to see that. So we'll start off, we've still got a, we're still waiting for a few people, but we'd like to start on time. So I'd like to start tonight, um, Jason, just by asking you, how did you become interested in, I know you don't just focus on birds, but how did you become interested in birds and wildlife? Thank you. Um, I was sort of always interested in wildlife uh, ever since I was, you know, maybe two or three. I was uh, a big fan of watching documentaries about wildlife. Um, but obviously at that age, your uh, opportunities to look at wildlife in the field are very limited. Um, you know, I couldn't walk for more than sort of two kilometres before getting very tired. And so that all took a back seat until sort of my early teenage years, uh, at which point uh, my family actually moved to Warriwood. And to get home from school, I'd actually could either wait for a second bus to take me about two kilometres or so, or walk through Warriwood wetlands. And so it was actually quicker to walk um, through Warriwood wetlands. And so I took that option and it didn't take me very long before I was very interested in all these birds that I was seeing and hearing and had sort of no idea that they were in the area or what they were. And so that sort of catapulted and I began uh, actively searching for birds and looking at, at all these birds and learning the calls and the names and sort of from there, it, uh, you know, kept snowballing and here we are. Brilliant. Well, we love Warrior Wetlands. We're very lucky to have that area of wetlands. I'm sure many of you, a lot of you in Northern Beaches, I'm sure many of you have walked through Warrior Wood um, and we will be setting up our birding walks again very soon. So if there's a particular area in the Northern Beaches that you visit regularly and you'd like us to do a birding walk through that area so you know the birds that you're looking at, please email, um, uh, sorry, please put that in the, in the notes or the chat as well. So Jane and I were talking earlier about actually about doing a shorebirds walk at Long Reef. So um, that might be something you guys are interested in. But because it is, um, we're, there's a big bird week count on at the moment, which is kind of what this is all about. So what kind of birds can we expect to find in our backyards at the moment? Yeah, so there are a lot of birds that, you know, a lot of you would be very familiar with, um, and they're sort of generally species that are quite widespread, um, and they seem to cope all right with urbanization. And so a lot of birds that, you know, would be universally in almost everyone's backyards are things like Australian magpies, uh, pied currawongs, Australian ravens, yes. uh, and then there's also, you know, different types of birds. Um, so a lot of different honey eaters you can get, so particularly noisy minor. Um, they're something that is probably in everyone's backyard on the northern beaches. Um, and then other birds that feed upon a lot of nectar and fruit and things like that. So uh, different parrots, so rainbow lorikeet, and then obviously uh, seed eating parrots like sulfur crested cockatoo, um, you know, you might from time to time get galahs and corellas flying over or visiting your backyard. Um, so overall, there's actually quite a lot. You think, oh yeah, I wouldn't get that many birds, but quickly adding those sorts of common birds up, you could have 15, 20 birds in your backyard each day without really even thinking about it. Um, and then of course, if you live um, somewhere on the northern beaches, 
that does back onto bushland, like a bushland reserve or a national park, which thankfully there are quite a few backyards like that on the northern beaches, you will get some uh, different birds as well, particularly birds that uh, feed upon invertebrates uh, and then a lot of other rare birds. So, for example, um, I've lived in Warrywood and Cromer and I've been lucky enough to have flyovers of quite a few threatened species as well. So that can happen on the northern beaches, things like glossy black cockatoos and uh, a lot of different threatened birds of prey. Fantastic. So why is it that some, that some birds are more common in an urban environment? Some of them seem to thrive really well, cockatoos obviously, mm -hmm. um, is one, the miners, the ravens, we see a lot of those, the magpies, um, those seem to be in most garden so and certainly a lot of the school yards around here i know some of the children have to put their school bags inside because the uh, the ravens have worked out how to unzip them and get their lunch boxes out so obviously very clever um so why are some birds more adapted to to an urban environment do you think mm, well part of the answer does lie in the fact that some of these are quite intelligent birds uh, the ones that have sort of persisted in urban environments so like ravens and magpies are both quite social species and that means they have larger brain sizes compared to other birds. Um, as well as that, a lot of the other birds I mentioned that are sort of the ubiquitous ones, uh, they naturally had quite a varied diet and so that meant that when there were other sort of opportunities for them that were similar to what they naturally eat, uh, they were able to sort of quickly switch and try these uh, new varieties of food that were on offer. Uh, whereas, you know, some birds that aren't common in these environments were sort of naturally very specific in their diet or very specific in their nesting requirements, things like that. And so, uh, as well, a lot of the birds that are more common in urban environments are generally larger birds. Uh, so you don't see as many smaller sized birds. And that also ties in with the fact that they can't fly as well. And so for them to travel from backyard to backyard or through different patchy remnant uh, bits of bushland, it's a lot harder for a smaller bird to do that than it is for a sort of much larger bird um, that would be a strong flyer. Mm. Do, you think it, do you think it also relates to um, having a certain type of habitat in your garden? For example, at the Coast Environment Centre, we've just planted out a whole area for small bird habitat. Um, yeah. You know, the more prickly, bushy plants that they can sort of get away from the bigger, the bigger predators. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that, that ties into it massively because even in these, uh, you know, if you look at suburb to suburb, a lot of the older suburbs that were sort of gradually developed um, and, you know, 100 or more years ago on the northern beaches sort of retained a lot more canopy trees. Um, and also still had a lot more mid-story trees. And so if you think of suburbs like Avalon, for example, um, and other places up that northern end of the peninsula, they do have a lot more canopy compared to one of the newer developments like Warrywood Valley, for example. Yeah. Um, so yeah, habitat really does, um, you know, does influence play, a lot. It yeah. does play a role. So is there a particular, you know, what can we do to attract a more diverse range of of birds into our back garden? What does a, a you know a wildlife haven look like? Yeah. What should we definitely have in our gardens? Yeah, well, it um, really depends on what suburb or what type of uh, area you live in. Um, and so if you do end up you know, wanting to plant more uh, trees in your garden, council can definitely recommend a few species um, sort of tailored to your suburb. But generally speaking, um, Attracting invertebrates is a really, really good first step because uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of the birds that are missing are the ones that feed on insects and beetles and things like that. Um, and so a lot of our gardening these days, we sort of want to get rid of invertebrates, but if you're attracting them to your garden, that'll have a sort of uh, cascade effect all the way up the food chain. And so you'll start getting more like a much larger variety of these birds visiting your garden um, and so as part of that you're going to want sort of all layers of vegetation you'll you'll want to plant canopy trees if they're not already there and then a mid-story and understory as well um, something that's worth looking into as well uh, if you're very serious about attracting wildlife and birds to your garden uh, would be putting in a freshwater pond 
um, of sort of any dimension. Uh, a lot of people have had success recently in converting their old swimming pool into a sort of freshwater pond by just letting it take over. Uh, and so from that point of view, you'll get, you know, all sorts of wildlife, but that food source, um, in addition to the water source, will attract a lot of wildlife and birds that might be flying over and then will come and use it as a rest stop. And then that gives them the opportunity to travel to a next, you know, backyard habitat. Um, in addition to that, a lot of, um, you know, gardens these days are very focused around grass and lawns, um, very manicured gardens. Uh, for wildlife, that's not really something that they're looking for because they're sort of not evolved to be looking for that um, type of habitat. And so there actually are a lot of native grasses that you can plant as well, uh, a few different poa species. And uh, I'd really encourage people to start planting native lawns if they want to have grass on the lawn in their garden, rather than things like buffalo and that don't offer any sort of habitat value. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I know that buffalo and I think it's the water Riley or something always has to be on sale and, and being sold. Um, we might just sort of ask you guys, could you start telling us in the chat the types of birds that you get in, in your garden? Um, we're quite keen to hear from you. We don't know whether how much knowledge of birds you guys have got, so it's hard to sort of know where to pitch this. So if you can just start telling us some of the birds you've seen in your garden, um, that would be really helpful. And there might be some exciting visitors, actually. But one of the, which brings me to my next question, at this time of year, so we're in spring, um, are we likely to see any seasonal visitors coming through? Yeah, uh, so we've actually got one of the uh, seasonal visitors sitting on the table, um, <laughs> which is a sacred kingfisher, uh, which is a species that travels down from far north Queensland and Papua New Guinea at this time of year. Uh, and they sort of head a long, long way south and a lot of, different birds like this um, sort of travel from uh, far north Queensland and Papua New Guinea, and then they'll breed and nest down in New South Wales. Some of them make it to Victoria as well. Um, and so there's maybe a dozen or so species in that type of category that you could have uh, passing through your backyard, even if they don't stay. Um, so, just I'll name a few. There's obviously the channel billed cuckoo, which is very loud, and I'm sure most of you would have at least heard of them. Um, and then, those now gone. Yeah. All night, all day, and all night. Yeah, yeah they are pretty I hope they don't come back this year. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, things like the coel, which is also uh, pretty noisy and well known. Uh, both of those are cuckoo species. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few other cuckoo species which can travel south at this time of year and head eastwards as well that have come from inland Australia. So you could have a shining bronze cuckoo or horsefields bronze cuckoo passing through your backyard. Um, and then a few other birds like leaden flycatcher. Um, I've had them in my backyard before as well and they travel again north to south. Uh, Black-faced monarch is another bird that can be moving through. Uh, and that's a really uh, cool looking bird with lots of orange and black on it. Uh, so yeah, there's quite a few seasonal visitors. Uh, and the other thing is a lot of them will migrate at night time because there's less predators and it's not as hot. And when they're doing that, they'll yeah. call as well. So sometimes um, you might hear some of these interesting sounds at night and they're, uh, if it sounds like a bird, it's probably one of these migratory species. Um, so yeah, that's something to keep your ear out for, even at night time as well. Right, and of course we're we're losing some of our migratory species as well, aren't we? I noticed at Warrywood that there's um, a lot less than there used to be. Mm. So what's some of the causes that's that's creating that, that yeah. issue? Yeah, well, there's, there's a few different causes. So because um, these birds are covering you know thousands of kilometres each year, uh, the fragmentation of habitat would have a big effect on them if, you know, they have to fly over a hundred kilometers with no, you know, suitable habitat yeah. to feed in. And that's yeah. why, you know, planting these right trees in your backyard is so important because you might think, well, what's my one backyard in a, you know, sea of houses, but, you know, to a bird that's migrating and has already flown 2000 kilometers, that could be the crucial, you know, feeding stop or resting stop for them. Um, as well as that, 
you know, a lot of uh, feral species impact on all birds, not just migratory birds. Um, and then as well, for example, at Warriwood, they've got, um, you know, increased competition from yeah. things like bell miners, which are native, uh, but they are listed as a key threatening process, so they are damaging. And um, I could talk about bell miners for 45 minutes, but I'll, I'll move on. Uh, and then as well, other migratory birds, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, are uh, things that like migratory shorebirds, so they'll fly uh, from Russia and Siberia to you know Australia, a uh, massive, massive journey, and then they'll fly back again at the end of the year. So they come here in summer, um, and they're facing a lot of uh, threats with habitat loss, uh, mainly throughout Asia Pacific, so dredging of wetland and mudflat environment so yeah lots of habitat for a lot of these yeah and that's not necessarily habitat in australia is it that's no. habitat on yeah on route as well yeah, yeah yeah particularly for those birds coming from siberia it's, a lot of the problem is those halfway stops that they use to stop at a note over there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So don't forget to use the chat function to send in your questions and also um, any unusual sightings you might have seen that you can share with us. And also the other thing we want, so three things, are your questions, any unusual sightings, and anywhere you'd like us to lead a bird walk um, on the northern beaches so we can start building up the bird walk again. So I think we've had a couple of questions coming in. We're just having an issue with reading our colleagues' writing. <laughs> so uh, Amanda asked, where do coals come from? Um, and so they, they migrate um, from Papua New Guinea and elsewhere just north of there. Um, and then, yeah, travel south. So during the winter time, almost all of them will leave New South Wales and will leave most of Queensland. Um, some might overwinter in far north Queensland, but yeah, almost the entire population will head north uh, up into Papua New Guinea and further north uh, throughout Asia. Okay. And um, is there anything that we can, you know, obviously in the summer months we need to leave water out and things like that. What's your thought on leave, leaving out food? Uh, yes. It's controversial. <laughs> yes, I know that. It's, it's controversial. a controversial question that I wasn't prepared for. So, <laughs> um, it, it really depends, you know, over, for example, in the United States and the United Kingdom, where there are so many bird watchers, literally millions of bird watchers, uh, having backyard bird feeders is very socially acceptable. It, millions of people do it and it you know in in turn creates lots of very interesting records that people have you know this hummingbird that's never been seen in their state coming to their bird feeder um, and so you know there's lots of things like that um, and I guess within Australia there is a very big sting, stigma about um, sort of feeding birds not being good um, and I think that's because historically it wasn't done in sort of an appropriate manner. So, you know, feeding ducks bread isn't good. Yeah, um, and good. feeding, you know, any bird bread really isn't good. And so there are certain foods that you shouldn't be feeding to birds. Basically, you should be mimicking as closely as possible what they will normally eat um, and then offering them, you know, that sort of food in moderation can be okay. Um, and there are places throughout Australia, uh, a lot of uh, sort of, they call them lodges in far north Queensland, put out fruit at bird feeders um, with, you know, seemingly no negative effects because it's sort of quite natural food that they would encounter or encounter very similar species to uh, in Australia. So feeding birds can be okay and it, you know, helps sort of foster a connection between bird, birds and us. Um, so from that point of view, it is beneficial. Um, but yeah, it really comes down to making sure what you're feeding them isn't detrimental to them, because uh, in that case, you shouldn't be feeding them, yeah. Okay, all right. So do you have a, this is a bit of a corny question, but do you have a favorite bird? I do actually, um, it's for this week, it changes a lot. <laughs> um, and luckily uh, my favorite bird, I've actually got a photo of, so I'll uh, share that with you in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so it's actually, whilst that photo is coming up, um, it's a bird that I recently saw for the first time, and it's called the Plains Wanderer, that, yep, uh, and you'll be able to see it in a second. 
And so the Plains Wanderer is a, a very funny looking bird, uh, as you can probably see now. It looks a little bit like a button quail or a quail, um, but it's actually sort of in the shorebird family and it's the only species that's still alive in its um, family. So, um, yeah, uh, so, uh, it, yeah, in its family. And so um, it's critically endangered. Um, and so it's a very, very rare bird. Um, and it's found throughout Victoria, uh, New South Wales, particularly around the River Greener area near Daniloquin, um, and that sort of area um, down towards uh, not far from Mildura. And then there's sort of a isolated population in far western Queensland. Um, so very, very strange bird. Um, and it's actually sort of very well known worldwide because it's the most evolutionarily distinct bird in the world. Um, and that's because, as I was saying, there's no close alive relatives of it. Um, and its closest alive relative is a bird from South America. Um, and they sort of haven't been closely related for a very, very long time. Uh, so, yeah, a really, really cool bird to see. Um, and I saw that one just sort of two weeks ago now. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. fascinating and a beautiful plumage. Mm. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do with you guys was was do take you through the backyard bird count. That's happening this week. So you've got um, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday to uh, contribute to it. Um, and we actually went outside and did a 20 minute bird watch, which is all you need to do and recorded all the different um, birds that we saw. So we're going to show you how to fill out the backyard bird count survey in a second. Um, but just before we do that, why, What's the importance? Why, why are we asking everybody to go and fill out, survey the birds that are in their backyard, this sort of citizen science project? Uh, what's it contributing for? Mm. What's it contributing to? Well, there's, there's sort of a few ways that, you know, the backyard bird count and citizen science in general uh, contribute so much. I think, first of all, to have, you know, that much data coming in, and you'll see in a minute that, um, I think so far in the past three days, 2.6 million birds have been counted as part of the backyard bird count. Um, and so that's data that, you know, scientists just can't physically get um, on that sort of scale. And, you know, if you're doing the count from your backyard, again, you know, you can't just have people wandering through your backyard. So there are these unsurveyed areas of private land all throughout the country. Um, and, you know, birds turn up in funny places. You might think, well, my backyard is nothing special, but there is a, a chance that, you know, within the last 10 years, you've had a, a very rare bird in your back garden. Um, and so getting that data is really important. Um, it also acts for the future to monitor changes in you know the frequency of sightings of these birds um, and so there were quite a few articles i think last year about that data about how laughing kookaburras had declined by i think it was 30 percent or something uh, That's a and, huge yeah yeah wow. and so all these other things and so having that really large uh, pool of data means that you know we can understand um, just how the changes of birds have occurred. Um, yeah, so things like that. Okay. So somebody just asked us, is there an app where we can record and identify birds? So we're going to have a look at that in a minute. And um, BirdLife, which is the app we're going to use, actually there's a really easy way on there to help you identify birds. Um, it literally asks you what sort of size it is, gives you a few silhouettes, what colour, and it basically just drills it down a bit like a dichotomous key. Um, and they've also got 40 of the most common bird calls as well, which is which is really good, useful to listen to. So um, I might get Tim, who is our IT guy, to um, share the screen with you, and then we can have a look at the backyard bird count. And we're actually going to fill in the birds we saw today out the front of the Coastal Environment Centre, those of you that haven't been here, we're on a coastal lagoon, so we get a bit of a, a variety. Um, so I think you can all see that now. Can we just get some thumbs up if you can see Aussie Backyard Bird Camp? Brilliant. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
So as you can see, it runs from the 19th to the 25th of October. So, and there's so 2.7 million birds have been recorded, which is great so far. We've still got a few days to go. The weekend will probably be quite big. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you can get out into your garden this weekend and you only have to sit for 20 minutes and just record all the birds that you've seen. Um, and as Jaden said, this data is really useful. Um, I'm quite shocked that kookaburras have declined by 30%. I find that quite alarming, but obviously it's good for us to know this information um, and then we can hopefully try and do something about it. So we're going to go in to the backyard bird count. And you can see here that you just fill out your details. Um, so yeah, I'll get you to quickly fill that out Tim. Just do it as, at the Environment Centre. We'll have to get through this bit quickly. Um, but as you can see, you literally, all you have to do is sit in one spot for 20 minutes and record every bird that you've seen. Um, and then you just drop that down and you can go onto this app. So you need to Google BirdLife Australia and that will take you to, there's a mobile app so you can download it straight onto your phone or your iPad if you're using that. And then there's also um, the computer, there's also the app that you can download straight to your computer. Um, incidentally, nothing to do with this, but while Tim's filling that out, uh, the Australian Museum have got a brilliant Frog ID app as well, which um, is another thing that you can do. You can download their Frog ID app, and you record, if you think you've got a frog in your garden, you press a button, it records the sound, it sends it off to the Australian Museum, and um, they will actually come back to you and say, yes, that's a prone tree frog, or that's a striped marsh frog, or it's not a frog, it's a cricket, or whatever. Um, and through that, they've managed to gather so much data on frogs around all of Australia. It's really great. So, you know, citizen science projects are, are really coming into their own and proving to be really, really useful. So Tim's just um, put submitting the checklist. So these are the actual birds we saw earlier. Um, so I think you just start by putting in, are, we, are you looking for the plover, Tim? Oh, pelicans, obviously we're on a coastal lagoon, our favorite birds. So we had pied cormorants, we had pelicans, um, mast lapwings. I did this in my garden a couple of days ago and um, unfortunately all I got was ravens and magpies. But, um, but I like ravens and magpies, so that's not an issue. So sometimes you'll get more than others. And there is also another app that um, from BirdLife Australia, they ask people to do a bird, this is a, a big push to get as many people as possible doing a bird count for one week in October, but they also have another app where you can submit a bird count every season, um, which again is really useful because we'll have seasonal visitors and you know, things change from season to season, depending on what's flowering in the garden. Um, so that's quite useful as well if you're, if you're really keen on it. So nothing unusual so far, Jaden. what we saw at the front, pied cormorants, silver gull, uh, the little black cormorants, the pelicans, we've got many ducks all being merrily fed bread by <laughs> masses of people, much as we try and get them to stop doing that. It's, it's an ongoing battle. Um, so we're really trying to do a big education program around that. It's not really getting through, unfortunately. Was that the lot? Is that everyone that we saw? So we've now put in all our, the birds that we observed in our 20 minutes um, and we submit the checklist. And that's it. That's all you have to do. And you might even be lucky and win a pair of binoculars. So um, if we can just hop onto the, the other website, Tim. So this is the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. This one can only be done until Sunday. Um, but if you Google birds in backyards, so it's all about backyards and birds, but there's two. This one actually gives you the opportunity to do multiple surveys throughout the year, which um, you know can only be a good thing. And also interesting, I guess, for you guys to see what type of birds appear in your garden. Have we got some questions coming up there? We're too far away from the screen to read the questions. What does that say? Video? It's instructor video. Oh. 
<laughs> there's an instructional video <laughs> too far away from the screen to read the questions and we can't read Tim's writing. Um, there's an instructional video on there on the app that you can watch and it just shows you how to do the backyard bird count, but it's really very straightforward. It's really very straightforward. Okay. We uh, also had a question about the uh, nesting season for spotted doves. Um, sort of we're towards the end of it. Um, so they start nesting from early September really. Um, and probably triggered by uh, that change in temperature, like a lot of birds are. Um, and so, yeah, they, they breed nest throughout September, October, sometimes into early November as well. Uh, really just depends partly on the success of that first clutch. Um, a lot of feral species like spotted dove um, will, you know, double clutch in a season. So they'll uh, sort of have two different um, sets of offspring. Uh, but yeah, so, Basically, the first three months of spring. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, the only three months of spring. <laughs> <laughs> spring is certainly three months. Um, so we're hoping to get some ideas about where you would like to do the coastal bird walks. Oh, we've had a couple here, DY and Curl Curl. So certainly um, both of those have got lagoons, which is great because it gives us another option for habitat and what have you. So we'll take that into into account. Um, the other reason we, we get a lot of ocean going birds at DY actually, which is great. But the other reason we were thinking of, of potentially doing one at Long Reef is because they have the kestrels up on the headlands there as well. So quite a few different species to look at. And I have actually seen a sea, a sea eagle there a couple of times, um, which is always amazing and majestic. Um, so any other, any other areas you would like us to do bird walks. Hopefully, um, hopefully some of you go bushwalking around here and we can help you identify some of the birds you see. Yeah, which would and, be good. Uh, I, I didn't mention it before, but it's worth mentioning. So the New South Wales sort of official bird list has recorded about 580 birds um, in New South Wales, but the Northern Beaches bird list is about bit over 300. So a lot of the birds that you get overall in New South Wales, you actually get on the northern beaches. And when you look at that sort of as a, a portion or a percentage of the land area, it's amazing that more than half of the birds in New South Wales are in such a tiny area. Uh, and that's just mainly thanks to such a diversity of habitats. And so over the sort of seven years that I've been bird watching, I've seen 265. Uh, so there are a lot of birds to be seen, you know. Uh, yeah, so lots of birds. So I'd encourage you all to get out there bird watching. And count them. <laughs> and count, count them, them really that's right. So somebody just asked, should they stay in one spot um, when they're doing the Aussie backyard bird count? Uh, yeah. So there, there are a few protocols on the website and that video will explain it more. Um, there's sort of a few options, but mainly it's a 20 minute survey from a specific spot if you're doing it at your backyard. Um, you can also, I believe, particularly with the bird data surveys, do like a one hectare area search. Uh, but yeah, generally it's easiest just to do that sort of stand in a spot for 20 minutes and record everything. Uh, yeah. And if you're doing it, would another question come through? Can't quite see that. Deep Creek and Warrywood. Oh, Deep those. Creek and Warrywood. So more bird walks, that's good. Yeah. Two of my favourites. Mm. I think Warrior's my absolute favourite. It's when I first got interested in birds. Me, me too. Was through there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a great. Yeah, great it's spot. amazing. Um, so now we're sort of open, really, to any questions that you have. Um, obviously, you probably uh, realise that Jane is a bit of an expert. So if you've got any specific questions about birds at all, um, please, please put those on the chat. Did you read that? Yeah. Uh, we had another question um, about tawny frog mouths stopping calling uh, and whether that was related to nesting. Uh, it probably would be. Um, so they will call more. Uh, yeah, we've got one here. Um, they will call more when they're actively searching for a mate. Um, and they, they will still call, um, you know, throughout that nesting period, but certainly not as much as beforehand. Um, they also 
often when they're nesting give a very strange call that's very different to anything um, that you'd normally hear throughout most of the year. It's a very sort of crackling call. Um, and yeah, so that's one to keep your ear out for as well. Um, yeah. So one of the questions we get a lot in the spring is what should I do if I find a baby bird? So um, we, had a, we had a couple of ducklings brought into us last week that would literally look like they'd just come out of the egg. Um, and I know when I worked at Centennial Parklands, some of the baby tawnies would fall out of the tree. We would actually just section that off so that it gave the parents time to come down and um, rescue the chick, as it were. So if you do find um, a baby bird, be it a tawny frogmouth or, or a magpie or any of the others, what, what's your recommendations for that? Yeah, well, if, you know, as Jules was saying, if you're able to section that off, that's sort of the, the best option. Um, you know, if you're able to safely do that where there's not going to be, you know, someone's roaming pet cat or someone's dog or something like that. Um, if there's not going to be threats like that, if it's just in your backyard where it's relatively safe, it is best to leave it and monitor it and um, wait and hopefully the parents come and, um, you know, feed it or coerce it back up a tree wherever it came from. Um, but it's sort of if it's been, you know, a whole day of, uh, you know, nestling on the ground with no sign of help from the parents, then I'd, you know, recommend intervention. Um, and so possibly at that point after a full day, take it to a vet because it, you know, seems that the parents aren't going to um, help it. Uh, but yeah, generally it's best to not interfere because they are likely watching or coming and feeding it every half an hour or so. Mm -hmm. uh, even the other day, actually, I was uh, walking through Warrywood and there was a noisy miner that must have been four days old or so. Um, but the parents were coming down and feeding it on the ground. Uh, so it was relatively safe. Um, and eventually it would be able to make its way back up the tree. So, um just on that, so obviously the good thing, a good idea is just to watch it for a while and um, see if the parents do come and rescue it. But if you think, if you've got a neighbour with a roaming cat or you think it's going to be in danger, um, you can call WIRES or you can call Sydney Wildlife Rescue. Um, we've got lots of, of bird carers on the northern beaches, which is fantastic. Uh, and they'll come and, and rescue the bird for you or they'll at least come and assess it or they'll ass assess it with you over the phone. Um, and then we've got some great vets, as Jane said, Mona Vale, um, Collaroy, they're fabulous. They'll, they'll take all our native species and, and help look after them. We've just got another question come through. Ah, um, and so we had a question about fairy martins. Um, and they're not, uh, and whether they migrate to our area or if they're here year round, um, it seems that they're more of a bird that sort of passes through our area on migration. Uh, so you get them occasionally. Uh, I've had them a handful of times, but mm, you know, they don't tend to stick around in that one area for a while. Um, they're re relatively common, well, they're very common bird throughout most of New South Wales, uh, but coastally both fairy and tree martens are pretty uncommon. Uh, you know, they certainly have the areas where you do get them coastally, but yeah, uh, both the fairy and tree martens tend to just pass through on the northern beaches, um, often just sort of a handful of birds, sometimes one or two on their own, passing through. Um, the most I've ever had together would be about a dozen, um, but again, they hung around this sort of one paddock in Warrywood and then were gone the next day. Um, so, yeah. So you think they were just passing? Yeah, just yeah, passing they through. sort of found a nice spot to stop and kept going. Okay. And are there, so are there any good news stories? Because we hear a lot about um, species that are sort of, you know, on the vulnerable list and moving up to the endangered yeah. list. And, and is there anything that's been reversed? <laughs> there are. Um, there's, um, you know, a lot of conservation work that's sort of begun to happen. Um, and so for these examples, these are birds that did plummet in numbers initially, uh, but the good news has happened recently. And so a lot of, like our knowledge of genetics has improved a lot in the last 20 years. And so that's helped with a lot of sort of uh, 
ex situ breeding programs. Um, and so there's now also a lot of captive release programs for critically endangered birds. So, um, for example, the yellow tufted, uh, well, the subspecies of the yellow tufted honey eater, the helmeted honey eater uh, in Victoria, uh, took a massive hit due to habitat fragmentation. Um, and essentially, there's been a big breeding program for them, and they're actually now looking at using genetic restoration. So they're restoring the, the natural gene flow from the Gippsylandicus subspecies of yellow tufted honey eater, and they're using some individuals to improve the genetic uh, variation of the helmeted honey eater. And so that seems to be something that um, is a positive outcome because without that intervention, they've done modeling that predicts them to go extinct in 50 years. Um, but so that was a bad news story that's been turned into something positive because we now have the knowledge to save this species. Um, and then things very, very interesting. That bird I mentioned before, the Plains Wanderer, um, critically endangered. Almost nothing was known of this bird in the 1980s. Um, and then from there, just our knowledge has greatly improved, um, mainly due to a handful of people um, that have done so much work on that species. And so our knowledge of how to manage them has improved a lot. And so they like grasslands with sparse herbs and vegetation that are sort of uh, 20 centimetres apart. And very, very interesting, uh, the management for Plains Wanderer in Victoria and southern New South Wales actually is almost entirely reliant upon grazing from sheep. Uh, and it's actually done in a very careful way to ensure that that level of vegetation remains exactly how they like it. Um, and so it's not often you think of conservation being reliant upon, you know, like a farmyard animal and something that can be a feral species. But it's very interesting the innovative ways that we're coming up with to save these species. And so now we know, you know, how to preserve the habitat of plants wanderer. That's um that's quite an interesting relationship. Yeah. So we've had a couple of questions come through about cockatoos. Um <laughs> why do cockatoos sh shred trees? Well they can be quite a nuisance. I had a wonderful uh, passion fruit growing and I watched two of them one day just literally pick every fruit off and throw it on the ground purely for fun, it appeared. Yeah. So why do they do that? Why do they shred trees? Uh, well, partly um, sort of to keep their bill short because uh, their, their bill will keep growing if it's not regularly used. Um, and then it's maybe in some circumstances like yours, they, they were bored. Um, and you know they decided that your passion fruits have to be uh, dropped on the ground. But yeah, generally, generally, um, yeah, sort of to keep that that bill short. And yeah, they are all parrots have very very large brains for birds, yeah. and so they do require some sort of you know stimulation. Um, and so they are very curious as yeah. such, and so they will investigate things. Um, yeah, that yeah. they might not have come across before. And so for them, it's sort of, you know, learning by playing in a way, I guess. So. We, I used to do some teaching at Centennial Park and we started one particular tour under some pine trees and these cockatoos would drop pine cones on our heads <laughs> literally every time. It was just it's yeah. bizarre. Yeah, uh, I had the same thing at my school, actually, <laughs> with the pine cones, yeah. Um, so another question, where do glossy blacks nest? Okay. Um, generally speaking, um, so for those of you who might not be familiar with glossy black cockatoos, um, they are a threatened species. Um, they're, one of their strongholds throughout New South Wales would be the northern beaches, in fact. Um, and so they do nest locally. Um, and like most other parrots, they nest in quite large tree hollows. So um, yeah, a, a decent sized tree hollow but they are not particularly good with coping with urbanisation. Uh, I have, they're a bird that I have had fly over um, near my backyard quite a few times in Cromer, but it's always travelling between bits of habitat generally. Um, so their nests also are in these sort of, uh, you know, gullies and areas that are not 
widely uh, visited by humans. So, um, you know, places throughout Garigal National Park and Kuringai Chase National Park, uh, they definitely nest in, uh, particularly around the West Head area. Uh, that has the sort of habitat and the large hollows and the lack of disturbance uh, that they really like. Uh, but yeah, there are species that was massively affected by the 2019-2020 bushfires. And so they started turning up at all these coastal locations throughout northern New South Wales where they'd never been seen before um, and turned up at like Lake Kajelago where they'd never been seen before. So they do have the ability to travel long distances, um, but they're very particular in their feeding uh, requirements. So they really like casuarina and other casuarina species. And so if you were to plant, you know, other casuarina littoralis or toyolosa, or any of the other ones you get locally, um, you'd have a good chance of attracting them to your garden. Um, and they're also, that, those aloe casuarinas are also quite good at controlling weeds through allelopathy, so they suppress weed growth um, and other plant growth, uh, and they provide a good layer of mulch for other wildlife, so that's a good one to plant. Oh, okay, thanks for that. So they're not really seeking out human interaction, or whereas the white cockatoos don't seem to be mm. to solve them. Sorry, cockatoos don't seem to be remotely bothered by us. No. Um, and obviously the glossy blacks would prefer we weren't around <laughs> close to their nest. I actually saw some down at um, the dog park at Long Reef, which really surprised oh, really? me. Yeah. They were in the trees down there. Didn't seem to be too bothered by all the dogs. So I think we had, did we have another question come through, Tim? That you held up that we could read? Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, noisy miners increasing. Um, mm. I would say yes, they are, um, and they're a, a bird that has definitely benefited off human urbanisation. So naturally, so nosy miners are a kind of honey eater. Uh, there's a few different kinds of miners as well. So there's the yellow-throated miner of inland New South Wales, and then there's the black-eared miner, which is either critically endangered or uh, functionally extinct. Um, and so noisy miners are the ones that have increased the most uh, and yes they're sort of not a good species to have around again similar to the bell miner because uh, they do actively drive away other birds uh, so they're very competitive and they like to see the horizon and so that's why they've benefited from habitat fragmentation so much because there are so many opportunities for them to see the horizon because they like to watch out for predators um, and so that's really what's allowed them to uh, explode in numbers here. Mm. Uh, there are, interestingly, for both bell miners and noisy miners, uh, there have been successful control programs. Um, so noisy miners have been controlled at sites where regent honey eaters, which are critically endangered, and painted honey eaters, which are vulnerable, have been found. Um, and so they ended up culling, I think, about a thousand noisy miners over a three-year period um, near sort of uh, Hunter Valley and um, that was successful and they had an increase in passerines there, so like um, songbirds and they also had a like painted honey eaters nested the year after most of the noisy miners were rem removed um, and with bell miners they've done big culls of them um, to stop bell miner associated dieback which is basically where the gum trees die off because there's too many uh, silid bugs um, and basically the bell miners chase away the birds that would eat these bugs and these bugs then eat all the gum leaves so the trees die. Uh, yeah. Actually, we're nearly out of time, but um, when I last walked through Warrywood, that I, um, there were so many bell miners in there. Mm. I just, you know, that was almost a few whip birds, but definitely yeah. the bell miners had got a, a bit of a stronghold going on there. Yeah, definitely. So that was a... Well, thank you so much, Jada. It's been lovely chatting with you about birds. And um, thank you all for joining us. I hope you've learned something, found it interesting. Um, we've got four places you'd like to do bird walks, DY, Curl Curl, Deep Creek and Warrywood that have come through. So we'll certainly look at setting up some, some bird walks through those areas with Jaden. Uh, and we hope when we do, that you guys come and join us. So thanks very much. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you. Thanks, Jaden. Thanks for that. So knowledgeable.